11th January 1951. The mother comments upon some of the qualities enumerated in her article, What a Child Should Always Remember. On Education To be modest. This is to take oneself at one's true worth. Generally, people pass from an excessive appreciation of their personal value to an equally excessive discouragement. One day, they say, I am wonderful. And the next day, Oh, I am good for nothing. I can do nothing. That is like a pendulum, isn't it? There is nothing more difficult than knowing exactly what one is. One must neither overrate oneself nor depreciate oneself, but understand one's limits and know how to advance towards the ideal set before oneself. There are people who see in a big way and immediately imagine they can do everything There are petty officers, for example, who imagine themselves capable of winning all the battles of the world, and small people who think they surpass everybody in the world. On the other hand, I have known some people who had abilities, but who spent their time thinking, I am good for nothing. Generally, the two extremes are found in the same person. But to find someone who knows exactly where he stands and exactly where he can go is very rare. We have avoided speaking of vanity because we expect that you won't be filled with vanity as soon as you score a success. Just imagine There are plants which are vain. I am speaking of plants one grows for oneself. If one pays them compliments, by words or by feelings, if one admires them, well, they hold up their head with vanity. It is the same with animals. I am going to tell you a short amusing story. In Paris, there is a garden called the Garden of Plants. There are animals there also, as well as plants. They had just received a magnificent lion. It was of course in a cage and it was furious. There was a door in the cage behind which it could hide and it would hide itself just when the visitors came to see it. I saw that and one day I went up to the cage and began speaking to it. Animals are very sensitive to spoken language. They really listen. I began speaking softly to my lion. I said to it, Oh, how handsome you are! What a pity! that you are hiding yourself like this. How much we would like to see you. Well, it listened. Then, little by little, it looked at me askance, slowly stretched its neck to see me better. Later, it brought out its paw and finally put the tip of its nose against the bars, as if saying, At last, here's someone who understands me. Questions and Answers 1929 23rd June Although it may be true in a general way and in a certain sense that a yogi can know all things and can answer all questions from his own field of 
vision and consciousness yet it does not follow that there are no questions whatever of any kind to which he would not or could not answer a yogi who has the direct knowledge the knowledge of the true truth of things would not care or perhaps would find it difficult to answer questions that belong entirely to the domain of human mental constructions it may be he could or would not wish to solve problems and difficulties you might put to him which touch only the illusions of things and their appearances the working of his knowledge is not in the mind if you put him some silly mental query of that character he probably would not answer the very common conception that you can put any ignorant question to him as to some super school master or demand from him any kind of information past present or future and that he is bound to answer is a foolish idea it is as inept as the expectation from the spiritual man of feats and miracles that would satisfy the vulgar external mind and leave it gaping with wonder bande mataram volume 1 india renaissance the patriot who offers advice to a great nation in an era of change and turmoil should be very confident that he has something worth saying before he ventures to speak but if he can really put some new aspect on a momentous question or emphasize any side of it that has not been clearly understood it is his bounden duty however obscure he may be to ventilate it it is time that an indian who has devoted his best thoughts and aspirations to the service of his country should have in his turn a patient hearing shiva the inconscient creator by shri aurobindo a face on the cold dire mountain peaks grand and still its lines white and austere match with the unmeasured snowy streaks cutting heaven implacable and sheer above it a mountain of matted hair aeon coiled on the deathless and lone head in its solitude huge of lifeless air round above illimitably spread a moon ray on the forehead blue and pale stretched afar its finger of chill light illumining emptiness stern and male mask of peace indifferent in might but out from some infinite born now came over giant snows and the still face a quiver and color of crimson flame fire point in immensities of space light spear tips reveal the mighty shape tore the secret veil of the heart's hold in that diamond heart the fires undreep living core a brazier of gold this was a closed mute and burning source whence were formed the worlds and their star dance life sprang a self wrapped in conscient force love a blazing seed from that flame trance